And let me now talk uh, about two important parts of the foundations of DeFi, uh, stable coins and decentralized applications. So Bitcoin and Ethereum are incredibly volatile. So the price of Bitcoin is approximately five times the volatility of the stock market, or five times the volatility of gold. Gold in the stock market, about the same uh, volatility. So it is subject to large swings. Ethereum, about the same. So the idea of a stable coin is that it's intended to maintain a price parity with uh, some target asset. So the most popular stable coins are linked to the US dollar, but it doesn't have to be the dollar. Uh, it could be something else. It could be gold, for example. And when we say stable coin, uh, the coin is only as stable as the underlying asset. So even the US dollar can fluctuate in value. Uh, it's volatility is not that high versus other currencies, but nevertheless, it is not completely stable. Okay, so, so basically, um, this is uh, a great idea um, that allows people to get into the crypto space with a coin that is actually uh, not as volatile as, um, as something like Bitcoin. Of course, uh, if you're looking as a speculator for appreciation, there's no real upside here in terms of a stable coin, because let's say it's linked to the dollar. Um, but, uh, but it does provide an important aspect of stability, which is used in many uh, different uh, applications. So the idea, the basic idea of stable coin is not a new idea. So it turns out uh, before the Federal Reserve, it was common for banks to issue their own currency. And this is uh, a photo of a $20 bill from Merchants Bank of Augusta, uh, Georgia from 1856. And, um, and this is one from Boone County Bank, again, $20. And uh, it, if you look at the fine print uh, at the bottom, you'll see that this is actually backed by something. So there's collateral, and the collateral is uh, a portfolio of public stocks. Okay, so these banks would issue their own currency, and the, they would have to have some collateral. The collateral could be gold, it could be silver, could be public stocks, or it might even be government bonds that were issued. So essentially, this is just a way with some collateral uh, to have something that is linked to a dollar. Okay, so a uh, more modern example, of course, is uh, euro dollars. So it's a massive market in euro dollars, and effectively a euro dollar is a U.S. Uh, dollar account that's offshore from the US. It began in Europe, that's why they call it Euro dollar. But as soon as that dollar account is offshore, then it's no longer subject to Federal Reserve uh, regulations. So effectively, these tokens that are linked to the dollar have created the equivalent of a Euro uh, token. So uh, let's talk about the different types of stable coins. So the most popular are the fiat collateralized uh, stable coins. So this is a centralized mechanism. And let me explain why. So the idea is that you um, present a company with $100, they put it in a vault, and mint 100 of their stablecoin. So that uh, stablecoin is as good as the collateral in the vault. And the vault needs to have the $100. If it doesn't have the $100, then the value of the stablecoin is questionable. 
Now, it's interesting that the most popular uh, stablecoin is, is Tether, uh, and that is a stablecoin with a very complicated history. It's got a very large uh, market capitalization and daily trading volume that exceeds things like Bitcoin. So it's often the case that uh, the, if you're trading, let's say Bitcoin, that Bitcoin, Bitcoin is quoted in terms of Tether rather than US dollars. Okay, so um, it's got a complicated history because there's no regular audit of the reserves. In contrast, USDC, um, US dollar coin, that is backed by Coinbase and Circle. It's smaller, but a very important um, a player in the DeFi space. Uh, it resides on the Ethereum a blockchain, this version of Tether that also resides on the Ethereum a blockchain. Again, both of these coins are centralized. And again, the intuition is really clear. You need to trust somebody that the collateral is actually uh, there. So um, again, Tether has got a complicated history. They were forced to provide some sort of accounting of what actually uh, is backed um, as collateral. And it's not all uh, short-term deposits that revealed that they even hold a highly volatile cryptos um, as collateral. So, so again, this is a, a technology that's got um, in my opinion, much more risk than, let's say, U.S. dollar coin. Um, but people use it, and many people believe that the risk is small because they're using it very quickly. So you don't need to hold it for a long period of time. So there are also crypto collateralized stable coins. And we'll go into considerable detail in the third course, which is called DeFi Deep Dive on uh, the first collateralized um, uh, crypto um, stablecoin where you've got a, a crypto as collateral, uh, and that's MakerDAO's DAI. So DAI is the stablecoin, and it is very closely linked to the US dollar. The collateral, being crypto, is quite volatile. So as a result, you need to over-collateralize. So you can't have just 100%. Uh, you need to have much more, like 150% of collateral uh, when you issue uh, these DAI. And uh, in the, uh, the third course, we'll also talk about uh, synthetic uh, tokens from Synthetix and, uh, and, and talk about how they deal with uh, stable coins uh, also. There are also non-collateralized stable coins and these are not backed by an underlying asset, but they use uh, an algorithmic expansion and contraction of the money supply or the token supply to try to maintain a peg. So these are, are complicated and uh, there's not a great track record uh, when there's no uh, collateral uh, whatsoever. So to be clear, just to, to look at this, um, USDC is a centralized, collateralized stablecoin with, uh, with safe assets like US dollars. Um, DAI is a stablecoin that is also collateralized, but is collateralized with crypto, and therefore it is truly decentralized. So anybody can see uh, what's going on. And then the third class are these non-collateralized stablecoins, and again, uh, it is complicated uh, to make it work with uh, a money supply policy of expansion and, um, and contraction. So it is still, uh, frankly, a open problem here on many aspects of stablecoins, including the scalability of these uh, stablecoins. So to basically become a viable mechanism for transfers, it might be that the space needs to become much larger than it is uh, today. Um, let me talk uh, briefly about uh, decentralized applications. I've introduced them already, but uh, again, these are, they look and feel 
like the regular apps that we use on our mobile phones or our, um, our desktops or laptops, um, but they live on a decentralized smart contract uh, platform. Okay, so the key thing here is that there isn't some central server that is collecting your information and, and trying to uh, sell you stuff. These are being operated out of a smart contract uh, platform where you're actually putting peers together directly. There's no middle layer I hear. Um, these applications are permissionless. Anybody uh, can use them. And because of the nature of the Ethereum uh, blockchain, nobody can censor you. So it's not like you can be banned. That just doesn't exist uh, in this space. And of course, there's positives and negatives to that, but it's just a fact that this is censorship uh, resistant. Um, so I, I need to also introduce uh, this idea of DAO. So DAO is D-A-O, and it stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization. So this is a very special idea that is basically, it's an organization that is an algorithm. If you think about Bitcoin, it's kind of like that. It's just a program. And there are many people that they make their livelihood from the computer program. So think of the miners as being employed by Bitcoin. But for Bitcoin, there's no company. There's no board of directors, no CEO of Bitcoin. There's no financial statements. There's no tax. It's just a program. And smart contracts make it possible to have many companies like this, if we want to call them companies, that are effectively algorithms. So what has been done in the past where you start a company and you launch an app can be done much differently. You put a smart contract out that enables a decentralized uh, application. Again, we'll go into uh, more detail. Okay, so next I want to talk uh, about the problems that DeFi, DeFi solves. I've gone through some of the problems. I've given you an overview, but we need to go a little deeper into these problems so you fully appreciate the power of this disruptive technology.